Good morning, everyone. I have my pleasure and privilege of introducing uh, Roger Bivan, who will be talking to us about uh, uh, analysis of spatial data in R. Before we start with the uh, with uh, with Roger's talk, I I have uh, I have uh, I have this unique opportunity of in of introducing him, and I must admit it's always it's it's, it's always uh, a great privilege for me of being able to introduce all these great guests of the YR conference. So, who's Roger? Roger is an active researcher in the field of spatial data science, and actually he is the person who uh, started so who started actively on working with uh, on working with spatial data science in R. Of course, there were others uh, before him, like for example Brian Lipley, uh, but these efforts were um, were were also S. And Roger did uh, did his best to contribute tools for R. Here I have put uh, into the and uh, the first page of the article published at Geocomputation 2000. This article is about is, is 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 about integrating R with the with the GIS systems. So I I'm I I I am calling him this in this presentation one of the founding fathers of R spatial, and I really think that he was a figure important for the shaping of this community. But of course, Roger. Uh, had uh, had fulfilled many other important functions. He was he is a former editor of several scientific journals, and what is especially important for us, our journal, he is the current maintainer of the Grand Task View Analysis of Spatial Data. And trust me, it takes a lot of time and effort to investigate all of these fascinating packages and checking if they are really on the level to be included in the in the in the Grand Task View. He's a member of our foundation who is trying to help our community grow. And he's also, he, he's also a facilitator of our R special discussion panel. Being a bioinformatician myself, I have very little idea whom I can invite to the panel. And Roger was really, really, uh, Roger was really, really great because he spent a lot of his busy, uh, precious, precious time on uh, suggesting potential panelists. Thank you, Roger, for that. So I have put here some of the packages, uh, special data the packages to, uh, to which Roger has contributed. And as you can see, if you are, if you are even remotely related to special uh, data, uh, data analysis in R, you, see, you, you, are surely, uh, you are surely loading these packages. These libraries are essential for the special data science analysis in R. And Roger was, was one of the people on, in many cases, a, initiate, a, a creator of such package and uh, he contributed them to us. But also Roger is not only a programmer, he is, I think, by heart and uh, a researcher. And he was trying to combine the knowledge necessary to conduct uh, good special data analysis in R. And this knowledge was actually Mm, was actually published in a book form. And I, and I think the role of books is uh, underestimated in our community, but uh, applied spatial data science with R or ADAR as is commonly known from its acronym was published for the first time in 2008 and the second edition was published in 2013. And also for the very last slide, I have a I have an, mm, a summary of, uh, of Roger's activity in our journal. So in 2017, where Roger started to edit our journal, there were published 83 articles, four of them related to the spatial data, and some of them, and but 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 some of them were waiting till 2018 because Roger was a very careful editor trying to uh, trying to uh, find the best. Uh, uh, the best in, uh, in in gems submitted to our journal. So, Roger, thank you very much for with, uh, for being with us here, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michal. It's a very it was very uh, nice to be invited to Warsaw when the invitation came, and it was nice to see that the uh, YR organizers uh, have transitioned uh, excellently to an, an unfamiliar. 
at that stage medium. The sequence of webinars which were promoted by YR has been extremely uh, interesting. Many of us, I'm sure, have followed them uh, through the spring and the summer and the autumn and will continue to follow them. Uh, for those who need a view of spatial data analysis as it is um, developing, then one given by, uh, by uh, Jakub Novosad and Robin Lovelace uh, in March was, was really very nice. Now, I will share my screen to start on, on my talk. There we go. And this I will make a slideshow. Okay. So when uh, when the organizers contacted me uh, originally quite a long time ago, then the idea was to talk about uh, spatial data and R. And so I've gone back to the title of the of the book from two thousand eight and said retrospect and prospect. Now in the book, we don't reflect a great deal about uh, where things came from. So I'll give you a view of some of that. And I'll also show you more or less where we, uh, where we are at the moment, uh, which to quite a large extent is in a bit of a mess. Uh, not because we don't know what we're doing, but because there's so much going on that the uh, the marshalling of activities among the more than 900 packages which use the uh, R spatial infrastructure uh, is uh, obviously going to going to lead to to um, some distant dissonances. R is an ecosystem, and as R is an ecosystem, this uh, this gives us. Um, multiple narratives about what, what, what we may or may, or may not be uh, trying to do. So I'm staying with the title of the book. Um, the book began uh, in uh, around 2000. At, at the, it, the, the original invitation to start writing a book came at the time when the Use R series was begun by Springer. Uh, and I was contacted then to ask whether whether something could could be done, and uh, it took a long time, and the revision also took quite a long time. Uh, I've been asked whether there will be a third edition, and there probably won't because we're changing uh, changing approach, as I'll uh, mention, and also the technologies available for 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 writing books have, have, have also have also changed. The slides, uh, should you find that the resolution is too poor or that you want to get hold of the code that I'm displaying, uh, you'll find them on uh, on GitHub in my uh, area. And the repository is yr20 underscore files. And there you will find the, the materials. Uh, that's the, the, the this PDF with the slides. And you'll find the script and... and um, uh, what you need to, to reproduce what's going on. Now, in retrospect, uh, what we were doing, most of the people invo involved in, in using spatial data, uh, they had very little access to tools. Uh, most of the tools which were available were closed source and they were relatively costly. And depending on the institutional strength of your laboratory or university, uh, you had or did not have access to, to the tools you needed. Uh, grant financing of research at that stage was much uh, less frequent than it is today. Uh, we have no real way of monitoring the adoption rates of open source uh, software for spatial data analysis, um, nor do we know uh, the, the relative shares of our packages in this the, the adoption of uh, free and open source software. Uh, there was a free and open source for GIS uh, conference in Lausanne in 2006. And at that stage, one could see that quite a lot was going on. But things had already started happening in R prior to that. If, however, we look at the proliferation of reverse dependencies of the packages uh, providing infrastructure, providing class definitions and input and output, um, it appears that from 
a couple of packages. We've now gone to over 900, so that, that obviously something is going on, but whether uh, what is being provided matches the needs is, is something we don't know. Well, one of the things this large number of reverse dependencies creates is, is um, a, a perceived obligation to maintain backward com compatibility and to adapt to um, new data sources when and, when and if they arrive. So what is spatial data? So spatial data typically combines position in two dimensions, possibly in three, some attribute data and metadata. Spatial data presupposes that it's a subset of spatiotemporal data and that the data which are observed are observed essentially at a, a, a temporal cross-section. Uh, so that uh, spatiotemporal data incorporate data which has been observed at or uh, on occasion not at the same positions uh, through time. So that if you think of, of meteorological stations, they're reporting for a given, uh, for a given position at uh, fixed time intervals uh, through time from the time at which the station was, was established to the time at which it, it closes. Um, much of the spatial data could be seen as map data and map data is typically um, abstracted from the temporal dimension so that that all you would be able to do on a on a paper map would be to look at the bottom left or right hand corner to the information block to see when the when the map was last edited so when the last changes were made before it was committed to print and quite a lot of the the treatment of spatial data is to treat it as fixed at the time uh, at the time that it was committed to to file uh, this is obviously not uh, not necessarily uh, an adequate means of representation and it's something which we've been chewing over for well the uh, 20 years anyway uh, about how how to how to handle spatial temporal data natively and i'll get i'll get back to that in a moment so that among the things which we couldn't do before but which we can do with with uh, ease now is to use uh, open street map data so here um, the code is putting a box around the city where i work um, my location isn't shown on the map because i'm a little north of the city the light rail line hasn't been built north yet so what i'm doing is extracting light rail and tram lines they're actually the same system but they're encoded by different reporters uh, with uh, different values and aggregating them into one to taking the, the 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 points which were on the light rail line, the points which were on the tram line, putting them together. And one can then travel from the city center uh, to the airport uh, on light rail. And it's a system which has been very successful since it was initiated 10 years ago. But 10 years ago, we, shouldn't, we weren't able to show the data in this way, uh, partly because OpenStreetMap data was much more clunky uh, one needed to interact much more directly with the uh, with the data formats being delivered, uh, and there was much less of it. So that OpenStreetMap data is now uh, completely feasible for uh, for representing data. So this is something, looking backwards, that would have been really hard to do, uh, and now is uh, if you take the code, run it yourself, you'll see it runs pretty fast. Uh, similarly, there were other kinds of data which weren't available. Uh, there weren't any city bikes 20 years ago, but there are now. And the provision of city bikes is expanding uh, in many cities worldwide. So for the Bergen city bikes introduced in 2018, uh, it's possible to download the uh, CVS files. Here I've downloaded them uh, locally, but the, 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 the link is here. Uh, here, if you want to visit the site and download the, the files, you can do that. And you can then put them in a in a in a um, directory called VBS, and uh, run through the, the the files. This is for data up to about halfway through September. Using the uh, the ST Plan R package by Lovelace and uh, Ellis and Morgan, which has been subsequently updated, uh, you can handle the. Uh, origin destination data so that here we're creating origin destination data from all of the city bikes now obviously this is it's worth thinking about because all we actually have in city bike data is the uh, the place where the 
the cycle was checked out and the place where the cycle was checked in. We don't know where it's been in the meantime. If we want to carry on in our analysis, we have to limit our thinking uh, to saying, okay, so we assume that users of city bikes are going to uh, have a desire to travel from A to B. They'll check out a cycle at the, plate, the, the station nearest to A, will cycle directly to the station nearest to B, will check in the cycle there. That, that's the abstraction from reality that we're making here um, in, in looking at the data. But having made that abstraction, we can first create the, the origin origin destination lines, we can remove the ones where the cycle is checked out from the same station that it's checked into, then using um, the STPlanar package, we can create the origin to destination, uh, or take the origin to destination data, the flows, uh, and place them onto the stations from which the, where they're traveling from and to. So we get desire lines. Uh, and we can then map using Cycle Street, the, which, for which you need an API key, and I'm not revealing my API key here, uh, to find uh, which, if they were going to travel by cycle path, which cycle paths would be chosen. So these are the origin destination lines uh, here with an alpha uh, uh, and using the alpha channel to modulate the volume of traffic on uh, for, for between the, the, the combinations of stations. And here we have the origin destination data mapped to relatively credible cycle paths. Uh, the cycle paths are not the same as, as, as the road network uh, in, in this case, particularly uh, along the northeast edge of this, uh, of this um, um, it's not a lake, it's directly connected to the sea, but it's largely enclosed. So that this is the kind of spatial data which we, we now see a lot more of. Uh, previously, a lot of spatial data was, uh, was um, um, fairly standard academic data in the form of fairly standard academic data sets or data sets which were collected for research, research purposes. Uh, many of the uh, many of the um, uh, teachers or researchers who are working with data would be using um, geographical information systems for doing this. But in geographical information systems at that time, there was very little. Uh, there was very little provision of uh, analytical uh, analytical uh, functionality, so that typically one would be saving data out into. Uh, text files or C CSV files, and then analyzing it in some statistical software and then moving it back. It was very difficult to do in the field. So I, uh, I have by my main screen, uh, I'm in my office at the moment, which is why all the books are behind me. Um, I had a postcard sent by uh, a French ecologist who was in the field in 2005 on an island in a river in Tibet working with students. And he said, it's really nice to be able to use uh, the functionality in R because there's no license, there's no dongle, uh, which was that stage was a fairly large uh, plastic and metal contraption, which you attach to the parallel port of your laptop. And they were working in the field doing ecologies that they were uh, sampling, sam uh, they were sampling in the field and generating the sample locations uh, um, um, uh, on the fly. Uh, Patrick also contributed a function for uh, for inputting GPS data on the fly uh, into into uh, into R. So that this was the kind of uh, response we were getting from users of the software is that we we need to free ourselves from site licenses and we need much more analytical content than was available uh, than was available uh, elsewhere. Now, I got involved in R from late 1996. I was looking around to see what was available. Uh, and as you'll have heard from uh, previous talks uh, in the conference yesterday evening, then the, the, um, uh, the, the richness of R was already, or a lot of the richness of R was already present in, in the late 1990s. It was quite feasible for, for doing teaching and, and research. And because of the fact that there were, um, that there were uh, obvious links to, to S. The arrival of the S plus spatial stats module in 1996 was also 
interesting. So there were a number of meetings around this period where people got together and, and, and talked. Um, Albrecht Gephardt ported quite a lot of the uh, uh, available S code to R uh, in order to um, uh, support a course which he was teaching in, teaching in Klagenfurt. Previously, it had been taught using S and uh, transitioning to R meant that the S libraries also needed to be transitioned. So if you go back, you can see that Tripac and Akima were ported, uh, followed by Ash and SGeostat. And um, Albrecht also helped with the spatial package, which is part of uh, modern applied statistics with S, uh, the Venables and Ripley book, of which the fourth edition appeared in 2002. In the very beginning, the, the CRAN administrators were very helpful. And Albrecht and I presented a talk on this at, a, at a, uh, an economic geography, regional science, special econometrics meeting in 1998 in, in Vienna. Uh, in a talk, a similar talk given at Celebration uh, 2020 in Copenhagen, uh, I went through a, 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 an example of using what we were doing teaching in uh, in the late 1990s using uh, the R100 uh, release on, on Windows. I won't repeat that there, it's on film, uh, but if you're interested in seeing how things work, then this is more, the, 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 the Celebration uh, 2020 video is more or less uh, what it looked like. What, what did we need to do? We needed to cover auto, spatial autocorrelation, spatial regression, this is what what I needed to do from the Bailey and Gatrell book. This is the the Bailey and Gatrell book to the to the to the to the right here. This is what I needed to do because the other things were provided for in packages which uh, Albrecht had already uh, already uh, ported. I'd already written a good deal of code both in Fortran. I'd written in 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 Fortran and C for a, a CSTAT module, and I'd written other other things uh, as well, showing how one could could implement uh, these representations. Um, as a, a, a side point, uh, Michał and the others in Poland will know that I taught in Poland from 1975 to 1982, and my habilitation degree is on exactly the same kinds of things, on, on estimating spatial regression models. There was already R software for spatial point patterns and geostatistical inter interpolation, but there was none for spatial autocorrelation. Um, and these were the kinds of things which, which, um, which I started working on. Uh, I'll come back in a moment to talking about how the SP classes were created, uh, but I'd, I'd like to, to explain from the point of view of today that much of what we were doing then, that's the late 1990s was not so very different from what I was doing in my habilitation thesis in the mid 1970s. Uh, that many of the, the issues which are involved are still there and they're still there also in the context of, of, um, of uh, machine learning. So that among the kinds of things which, which helped and which I, which I learned from what I was doing with spatial autocorrelation uh, was the use of, of uh, classes for objects needed for testing for spatial autocorrelation. So I learned S3 classes uh, in the period before 2002 because they were what, what I needed to do the work I was, I was doing in the uh, SPDEP package. Uh, SPHET extends uh, the SPDEP package to cover uh, different estimators, uh, generalized method of moment estimators for cross-sectional models, and a very good uh, uh, SPLM package extends the PLM package to handle spatial panel models. That's when uh, when the uh, the spatio-temporal data are observed for each of the uh, um, spatial uh, observation units for each of the cross sections in time. So for a, a, a sequence of cross sections in time. Uh, and I've also attempted to, to do some work on comparing uh, uh, measures of spatial autocorrelation. Uh, my name's on a quite a lot of these things, but that's mostly because I'm a geographer, I'm not a statistician, and I really value feedback from statisticians who uh, can point out uh, not necessarily blunders, but suboptimal choices, uh, some of which involve 
uh, a good deal of, of um, gymnastics on my part to bring the uh, provided uh, implementations of algorithm in, into line. You'll also see this in some of the examples in uh, the SPDEP package where all kinds of mailing list questions or uh, Twitter questions come up and I attempt to account for why things are done the way that they're, they're done in, 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 in the examples on the help pages of the functions. What I didn't realize was that in attempting to work out how, how to represent neighbor objects, that's which spatial observation is a neighbor or is approximate neighbor of which, and the measures of autocorrelation turn, have turned out to be used in a wide range of, of packages in ecology, environmental data analysis, epidemiology, phytogenetics, and, and, uh, uh, and many others. Uh, this, turned, this was a big surprise. I, I had no idea really that, uh, that the other people were, were around. So one of the questions which, which was present then and continues to be present is, is our concern with providing special methods for handling uh, spatial autocorrelation. That's the, the uh, assumed interdependence of observations which are close to each other, that close observations uh, are, are more dependent on each other or more like each other than uh, distant observations. Temporal data, we know, breaks the funda fundamental rule of observation of observation. Social ne network uh, independence of observation. Social networks do too, and spatial data do too. Spatial data, spatio-temporal data do as well. In addition, we're not often not sampling from a known population to get observations, so caution is needed for, for inference. Um, uh, Brian Ripley has a uh, has a 1988 book on the uh, on the uh, joys of, uh, of uh, um, inference from sp uh, spatial data, uh, where he, he lists eight uh, major problems, um, uh, one of which uh, he summarized in another talk by saying that um, uh, in spatial data, asymptotics are a foreign country, which is, of course, as you extend the range of your data, your assumed data collection, your probably reaching a foreign country or possibly even uh, circumnavigating the globe. Uh, designing spatial samples is not, has, has not received very much attention. It was a fairly large part of, of uh, Brian Bertley's book in 1981 and, and um, Werner Muller's book from uh, 2007. It doesn't receive the attention that it should in teaching about spatial data, but that's a, that's a, a, a side point. So that if we want to um, uh, handle uh, the detection or classification of buttons and machine learning, infer about covariates or in interpolate from the fitted models, we need models that take account of uh, this independent, this dependency or possible dependency between data. Uh, and there's a paper by uh, um, Patrick Schatz and, and uh, co-authors from 2019 talking about this. And I'll come back in the, the end of the conclusions to mention some more papers looking at exactly the same thing. Because how to partition training and test sets when the data themselves have an, have an innate structure is, is, uh, is um, it's an interesting question about how to do it. Um, spatial point processes are one of the ways of doing uh, spatial modeling. Geostatistics is another disease mapping and spatial regression uh, is a third. But I'd like to get on to using a, a situation, a thought situation, where actually the spatial process is induced by the analyst simply by um, um, uh, the way in which the data themselves have been, uh, have been generated or collected. So what we're going to do too here is to tra treat a pattern which is uh, random, and then induce into it uh, something which will look like spatial dependence, but in fact is, is a missing trend. So what we'll do first is use the SPATSTAT package. And what we're doing here is generating completely spatially random points, but the intensity with which the points are generated is increasing towards the right. So it's increasing towards, towards the east, uh, so that the intensity is low on the left edge and high on the right edge. And so we're generating random points um, 
using this function here, but with an intensity function, which is saying that uh, as, as you move uh, eastwards or towards the right, the intensity of the process will increase. So we've generated a process which itself is random. However, uh, we know what's driving the, 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 the pattern which we observe. So that he, here putting a density plot behind it, we can see that this appear, there appears to be a pattern here, but actually the pattern is, is here because of the intensity function. It's not because the points are clustering together, it's because of an intensity function. Now, if we use Ripley's K hat to, 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 to test for the existence of clusters, we find yes, that from a fairly short distance, there appear to be clusters. Okay, so what we've done here is mislead ourselves by saying that we thought that we were looking at a process here, which was observed on, uh, on a, an undifferentiated plane, but in fact, the intensity of the process uh, increases from left to right, which was the wrong assumption. We shouldn't have assumed that, but we did assume it. and We tested making that assumption that the process was, was homogenous. If we use a, an inhomogeneous uh, test, um, the, the test goes out the other way and says actually that the points are more regular than one would have expected. Also because it's looking at the area as a whole rather than, uh, rather than uh, filtering out the, uh, the uh, in, inhomogeneity induced by the intensity process. Uh, we can convert this to uh, an SF and the SF package is what I've been using all the way through. So I started off using the SF package and, and map view to demonstrate the uh, light rail in Bergen and to demonstrate the city bike uh, tracks. And I'm using it uh, all the way through here as well. So we use library SF and we're taking a su subset of the uh, inhomogeneous point pattern object. However, when we coerce the object to SF, we get the first uh, SF uh, geometry as a polygon, which is the bounding box of the point process. Now we need to filter that out. So we're using this. We could have used this approach to do it, but this is just as simple and is actually syntactically uh, 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 so the label uh, is equal to point and label equal to point here is the same so that both are using the same the same kind of evaluation if we just take the coordinates out then we can generate uh, a normal variable which is uh, also skewed so that here once again we're saying that not only is the distribution of points uh, more uh, the points are denser towards the right but the the value of the y variable is going to be is going to be uh, increasing to the right so that we can see here that the the the, the relative count of values to the to, to the right which are higher value of the higher value of y is is much greater than than towards the left okay so we now have uh, a a, a um, geostatistical data set where the points were observed uh, in an irregular fashion but very often they are and where the the um, the y variable trends from uh, west to east. Now, if we ignore this and fit a variogram, and this is saying, what is the average distance between the, this is the gamma variable, uh, gamma value of the, of the, of the semi-variogram. What is the, uh, the average differ difference between uh, point I and point J at a short distance? The average distance is relatively small. Uh, as we as we move apart, the relative dif uh, distance increase. Uh, the relative distance, the the relative difference between the points at an increasing distance uh, increases. So this is a a, a, a suspicious uh, variogram, one which an analyst would say is improbable because one would expect, in general, uh, close range uh, covariance and we would expect it to flatten out. So this actually tells you there's a missing trend. If we include the trend, that's in this line here, if we include the trend, then we get a flat line. We're saying there's, okay, there's no spatial autocorrelation in this data at all. 
so that those those were two approaches to, to, to looking at the data. We can add a third approach of looking at the spatial autocorrelation of, of the data. But the observed spatial patterning, which we're going to see, is induced by our uh, missing assumptions. It, it's not generated. So we're, not, we're, we're seeing things which aren't there because we don't know what the underlying data generating process was. So that the first thing we do is to generate a graph showing who is a neighbor of whom. And then we're using uh, the standard uh, Moran's eye test, which returns a, a, an H test object. So this is uh, written uh, 20 years ago or so. And we can see that uh, this, the, the, the Moran's eye test developed uh, originally in this form with generalized weights by Cliff and Ord in 1969. Um, has a standard deviate as, as the output, and the standard deviate is obviously very far from, from, from zero. It's much bigger than plus or minus two. And if we calculate a p-value with a two-sided alternative, it's, it's highly significant for, for some meaning of, uh, of that term. This is the way in which the tests were, were originally presented. So we found highly significant spatial autocorrelation, and as a reviewer, I have problems because quite often I get papers to review which say, okay, we, we've looked at our data and there's lots of spatial autocorrelation there. And this will be presented as something wonderful rather than something which is indicating that perhaps we should go back and look at the way in which the data were collected. If, however, we run the regression of Y on X, we're not going to look at the the at the at the um, uh, coefficient value on x, but it would be the same as we use to generate the data set. Uh, then we find that there is no uh, no spatial autocorrelation in the residuals from this regression, which is is what we sh we should expect. There there is there's no reason there's nothing in the data generating process which is which is inducing it. What was inducing it in our perception of the data was the fact that we we had omitted a variable. And it's also possible to, uh, to get the wrong functional form of a variable and get a result in suggesting that we need special spatial methods. Uh, if we uh, go back to, to the, again, the mid 1990s, local Moran, uh, local Moran's eye was also an interesting, an interesting uh, innovation by, by Luke Ansel and, and, and others. And what we see pl plotting the value of local, local Moran's eye is that there are uh, there are high values of local Moran's I in in this this area? There are relatively few neighbors, but okay, we're, we're doing okay. But we could go over to 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 use the uh, to use the uh, 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 linear model that we calculated, including the linear trend. At which point we get to this one here. However, the the uh, the representation which we find in these differs depending on the way in which we're, uh, we are. Uh, so th this is this is um, looking at the the um, at the stand the the standard normal uh, deviates. So these are these are high standard normal deviates for the individual observations. There are some low standard normal deviations for 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 the in, uh, for the observations here. And here we see that when we actually account for the fact that in the case of the local uh, local Moran's eye, we're we're doing um, we're taking a lot of shortcuts. So that if we use the local Moran uh, uh, saddle point uh, approximation or uh, exact measure, there isn't a story. There's no spatial autocorrelation story here, even locally. There's the the there's so th maybe I'm talking myself out of a job here, but. The, that that's one of the messages I'd like to communicate. That in fact, uh, you, when you're using spatial data, what is really important is understanding uh, how the data generating process actually um, works, rather than jumping to the conclusion that this is spatial data. We have to use special methods. If you can grasp the uh, essence of the uh, data generating process, then it's very possible that you'll be able to uh, to um, to handle things uh, without going to special, so the, looking at the functional form, looking at the included uh, covariates, you may be able to handle it without special, uh, special techniques. However, 
in the test set, training set, uh, validation set uh, context, you you still need to be careful. Now, where did these the the these spatial packages uh, come from? Where did the infrastructure come from? Uh, I've already mentioned the 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 availability of packages and um, uh, Splunk's versus uh, spatial at Lancaster uh, package was available in in S, S and S plus uh, um, almost thirty years ago now, and I'd been in touch with Barry Rollingson in in uh, I, I, to look at trying to get uh, Splunk's ported, which which worked fine, uh, but I added a speculation in an email. To, to Barry uh, 22 years ago, uh, an issue that I've thought about a little is whether at some stage Albrecht and I wouldn't uh, integrate or harmonize the points and pairs objects in Splunk's spatial and geostat. So they were S3 objects. They aren't the same, but for users, maybe they ought to appear to be the same. So class representations uh, started to be visible as an issue. S say that we had um, uh, an object in Splunks, and we could calculate the k hat in Splunks. We could do the same in the spatial package, but the objects were different, so we didn't know whether getting a different uh, output would be because the functions were implemented differently, or whether the data was represented differently. And this this was continued when Spatstat uh, uh, arrived. Uh, the paper which Michal showed at the beginning, which was with Marcus Nettler and was concerned with co-working with Grass, also came in so that uh, uh, my connections were uh, a meeting in Vienna in 2001 when it was suggested that I could come and talk about the links between R and Grass. But this allowed me to see what was going on inside uh, R itself. Vienna, The Vienna meeting was quite small, so that there were about 75, uh, 75 of us there. Um, during 2002, then um, uh, I, I, I was uh, asked by Luke Anselin and Serge Ray to take part in a workshop in Santa Barbara, uh, where I made a number of contacts, and which also led to visiting uh, visiting Brazil in, in December. So that there, were, there was a there was a good deal going on, but we hadn't uh, found a, found a form. Um, the next Vienna meeting was to be held in March 2003, so that we decided to have a, a, a paper session on spatial statistics. And I asked Edsa Pepsma to, um, to, to join in. And as, uh, uh, as, as, uh, as you can see, in November 2002, uh, he wrote in an email to me, I, I wonder whether I should start writing S classes. I'm afraid that I should. And I don't know whether this is something which will uh, he will regret having done, uh, I think. Uh, his contributions certainly to S uh, SP were that uh, when when um, others of us were running off in 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 peculiar directions and he'd say wait 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 and uh, when there was a need to to do some uh, heavy uh, heavy lifting then uh, Edsa was the person who 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 made s serious contributions but Helio was also closely involved I met him at a grass meeting in 2002 and we spent quite a lot of time talking about the same kinds of same kinds of uh, uh, of things. Uh, then there was um, Barry Rollingson and um, and Paolo Ribeiro, who was also involved. Another person who was involved also in the map tools package was Nicholas Lewin Koch, and he wrote in March 2003 an email which which actually did shape the way in which uh, which SP developed. Um, he wrote, "My suggestion is that we set up a repository for spatial packages similar to the bioconductor mode." We didn't do that, where we have a base spatial package that has S4 based methods and classes that are efficient in general. And we did do that. So that we set up a collaborative repository um, after the Vienna meeting. We set up the mailing list. And the, the uh, task view was written shortly afterwards. Then we met again, or most of us met again later in 2003. We, uh, Barry invited us to Lancaster in 2004, Vigilio uh, to Valencia in 2005, and uh, SP was published in, in the fir first version, uh, pub published version arrived 2005. So we adopted um, S4 uh, classes for spatial objects. And they were designed to behave like data frame objects. 
then from the very beginning, we handled object conversion because we weren't interested in saying that everybody doing spatial has to use SP classes. What we said is that we'll happily provide coercion to and from SP classes so that it's possible for packages, say like Spatstat, who preferred to use their, their own class basis to interact directly with SP classes, which meant that they could use uh, the uh, SP class based uh, packages like uh, MapTools and Argoodle to uh, MapTools predated SP, in fact, um, but was converted to use SP to, 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 to interact there. So we weren't saying everybody has to use SP, but we were saying we're providing services, including coercion to other, uh, to other forms. Uh, the Argoodle package developed uh, greatly. Tim Kate was very helpful initially um, by setting up the framework, also using uh, S4 classes, uh, to uh, to um, bind to the uh, Google uh, uh, C++ library. Uh, and Barry Rollingson helped in many ways uh, later on. Okay, so that we then needed to complete the 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 the, the collection of, of packages and the the key one which arrived was was RGOS, uh, thanks to Colin Rundle's uh, uh, Google Summer of Coding project uh, ten years ago. So we we then had an SP collection of packages which provided us with with things that we could do. When we published uh, the first version of of our book, the book was a lot of work, but it was worth it, and we were in contact with really creative and helpful people on the way. There were relatively few packages which weren't actually written or maintained by the authors of the books and their nearest collaborators who that were using SP classes. By the time we published the second edition, we couldn't regenerate a figure we'd used in the first edition because there were too many other packages using SP. Okay, so then we moved to the to, to this was the period from 2013 to, 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 to today. And the number of packages which, which has developed has, has simply um, increased rapidly. Uh, um, Andres de Vries in 2014 published a blog and it was also at the, at the it was a poster at the Allberg, uh, Allberg uh, user uh, 2015 conference, which showed that there was a spatial uh, a spatial cluster. We didn't know that there was a spatial cluster in package space uh, in R, uh, seen in terms of page rank. But which packages depend on SP? And uh, the current uh, status, this is from about 10 days ago, but the code is, is in the GitHub repo. If you want to track this over time, uh, you're welcome to do so. Uh, and we we can see that there are the there are uh, our Google SP uh, RGOS raster is very important for raster data, uh, and so on uh, fields, random fields, GStat, um, SpatStat, Splanks, uh, and so on and so on. The, there are the, they're all essentially essentially here. Uh, as compared to the situation just a month ago, SF has actually moved into this cluster from uh, the tidyverse cluster which is probably because more and more packages fortunately are adopting adopting uh, SF and stars uh, and in uh, with relation to raster they're also adopting Terra uh, which is the 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 um, uh, uh, re-implemented uh, raster so the raster package was written to provide wrappers for the SP objects and so Terra has then come in moving away from SP objects uh, and raster worked uh, very happily on large uh, raster files uh, by reading and writing chunky chunks of data rather than reading and writing the whole the whole data into 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 um, into memory raster has also done very well in terms of say uh, google scholar uh, citations there are over 3000 just for that package which in terms of citations of packages it puts it right at the top uh, the Terra package uh, was published um, six months ago. It's also using S4 classes, but has introduced new classes and coercion mechanisms uh, to get back to, to uh, uh, classes used in, in, in other package. So ways forward. The SF package 
is well documented itself has uh, a, there's a lot of information on the r hyphen spatial uh, dot github dot io uh, site uh, something which some uh, causes a certain amount of, uh, of amusement is that there are two r spatial dot github dot io websites one is with an hyphen and that's sf and stars and so on so that that is largely uh, uh, in the orbit of of um, uh, Edsa Pepsma, uh, myself, um, and uh, uh, Tim Applehans, and and uh, lots and lots of others, but but it's that group. And then Rasta has R spatial without a hyphen, which actually has some really good documentation, particularly for raster-based analyses and for ecologists. Uh, in the same same general area, uh, you find uh, Google Cubes, which is building on the stars proxy approach, which means that uh, the idea is to commit computation to cloud nodes before your satellite data or Earth observation data is, is brought uh, over the wires down to your, down to your computer. Uh, there's lots more visualization stuff. Uh, I mentioned in particular TMAP, uh, which is, uh, is um, well-founded. It, it, it works really well for those who who know the uh, the um, lattice extra uh, ggplot2 plus notation for adding components to a, to a graphic display for, to a grid graphic display then you'll find tmap very easy to get your head around map view which uh, which was one of the first packages to uh, really provide uh, interactive mapping for our tmap has a has a view mode which does the same thing, and then the cartography package by uh, by Giraud and Lombard. Um, they give you plenty of alternatives for cartographic communication uh, and exploration. Um, we, in terms of editing things, then 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 three of us edited a a um, journal of statistical software uh, edition in special number in 2015, and there we've been careful to make sure that the uh, the, uh, in line with the Journal of Statistical Software, which EDSA is now one of the, the core editorial team, um, that we see the way in which people use um, published uh, papers as having the paper, having a computer, having the code, the packages, and having the data, and being able to read the paper, learning the methods at the same time as they're running the data. So we feel that this, this is a helpful mechanism. One of the uh, considerations is also uh, package dependencies. I've also mentioned uh, reverse dependencies. The class representations we feel are, are, are central. And we've also looked at the reverse dependencies of the SP and the SF, uh, SF package. Uh, there's a table here which is showing more or less what's going on. What we see over time, and I haven't done a time series of the table, is that, is that um, of the uh, of the non-recursive dependencies, uh, then then we're looking at um, uh, for SP itself just uh, 630 or 500 if we don't consider suggests and so on. But the number using SF uh, is is growing really fast. The number using SP has has flattened off, which is which is where we'd like to be. We'd like to transition uh, to using uh, uh, SF rather than than SP. Um, okay, I'm going to jump to the conclusions now because this is the scary bit and I don't want to scare people, uh, but I appreciate feedback on some of the points which are being made in the next section, which is about um, the difficulty of transitioning to uh, upstream software dependencies. In the case of the SP system and the SF system, both of them depend on a library called Proj, and Proj has been undergoing a lot of recent changes. In a Twitter comment to my announcement of this talk, then Howard Butler was kind enough to say that this is the important bit, but it's the important bit for people who like getting scared by things, um, where the scary slide is this one, where prior to uh, Proj version 6, then the Broad Street pump in London was where it should be. But 
when you introduce, when we introduced Proj 6, but didn't change SF and SP, uh, it had moved the Broad Street pump was the industry street, the industry place pump, not the Broad Street pump. This is the pump which uh, Dr. John Snow disabled in uh, 18, in the 1850s to terminate a cholera epidemic. So it was actually here and it was polluted and people were drawing water from it and getting ill. So he took the handle off, not because he'd done a map, because he also, he knew what was the cause of cholera, but his views were uh, were uh, not accepted by, by mainstream at the time. So that we've been using this in exercises for a long time. And then you, you present it to students and suddenly the Broad Street pump has, has jumped to industry place because you upgraded an, a package or a library, which uh, both uh, our Google and SF use. So uh, Edsa and I have been working quite hard since uh, since we realized that this was the case a year ago. And now we've got the points back here, but we've had to change the uh, the representation of coordinate reference systems internally in SF and SP. But there's there's a lot of there's a lot of information about this in in the, the slides which I'm jumping past. So I'll go straight on to the conclusions. Uh, uh, SF and STARS have have uh, done very well. They've moved moved forward a lot. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, um, SF is easier to maintain than uh, our Google and our GEOS is that they weren't able to use RCPP for interfacing external uh, libraries, but SF is. And because of that, the match is better and they're both much more maintainable so that creating an interface to uh, functionality available in GEOS or Google from SF is much easier than doing it using the SP side. Uh, there are lots of other things happening as well. Um, I've mentioned the changing in the handling of coordinate reference systems, which we're still working through. On my reverse dependency checks from last night, there are still about, there are a, a few more than a dozen packages which have some issues uh, out of 900. So that we're, we're doing pretty well. We're getting almost everybody on board. One of the most recent innovations is the use of the S, external S2 geometries for topological measures, predicates, and operations on spherical geometries. And this will be upcoming in, uh, in SF. Um, for those of you who know what a PROJ4 string is, then you need to understand the consequences of transitioning to well-known text two of 2019. If you don't need to know that, but you do use spatial data, then beware of the fact that your data may end up somewhere else than you expected if you haven't uh, looked at these things. Uh, we're also suggesting that people uh, um, step back from using shape files as a way of moving data around for vector data, but move to uh, GeoPackage, which is an international standard and is, is simply based on, on SQLite. Um, a point which people haven't realized is that while uh, in our, G, uh, our Google, we never got as far as adding a, a query argument to be able to subset spatial vector spatial data before reading it, uh, it's now possible in, in S, ST underscore read in SF. Uh, Roger, support... unfortunately, we are exceeding our hour, so... Yeah. We'll have to we'll have to stop right here. There were. Can I just I'll just show this slide. The, the, these are, these are the references. You've got the access to the slides. These are the references that people doing machine learning with spatial data should look at. Uh, okay, so I'll uh, unshare my screen. Uh, there I Roger, am. thank you very much for this insightful talk. There were some very interesting questions, and we will surely answer those questions in a larger in, 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 in the larger during during the larger oh. our special panel, which is happening in a second on a diff, uh, on, on on our Zoom uh, on our video channel. So That's, thank you very that is much exactly for watching. What I was us. hoping we would do. Yeah. Thank, thank, you, thank you very, very much, much for watching. Yes. Sorry, yes. sorry. Yes. And, uh, so j j for follow through into the panel. Uh, Zoom channel, so we have to ch switch channels now. Yes, uh, sir. Uh, so thank you very much and see you. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay.